I apologize sincerely to whomever I stole the organizing idea for this video from. I have gone back and looked for the article or video. I'm not even sure which it was. It might even have been a Facebook comment. Older men often appear more original because of their inability to remember their uh, sources. Anyway, if the idea was expressed in something you did or wrote, please let me know. I can't re-edit the video once it's posted, but I can add your credit to the show notes below the video, which is something I would like to lift up to all viewers. If written sources or videos bearing upon the topic of some video I have published come out uh, and come to my attention, and I think they are particularly relevant, I will add them to the show notes, even months later. So, uh, if you are reviewing a video, or if you are a new viewer and you are catching up on the channel, do have a look at the show notes. There may be some Easter eggs there that weren't in the description when the video was first released. You may notice that I did not tell you what the organizing idea of this video is. I am authoritatively informed by YouTube that promising a later revelation is a way of encouraging viewers to stick around and see the whole. Check my subsequent videos for more YouTube tips as I learn them. <laughs>
a, a somewhat moribund video game store, for those of you who don't know it, appears to be in the process of bankrupting Wall Street and taking over the U.S. economy. A uh, parathetic word of advice to hedge fund traders. Consider taking a course on budgeting at your local community college. And for heaven's sake, make your coffee at home. You don't dig yourself out of a multi-billion dollar loss by throwing away your money on lattes. Also, we have had a little snow here in Worcester several times. In addition, as I was preparing to frame the discussion of George Silver's manuscript for brief uh, instructions upon my paradoxes of defense, which occurred on the Silver live stream in December, I started a couple of rabbits and followed them down some rabbit holes. To wit, I have in my dilettante way been trying to figure out how Silver's unfinished manuscript was preserved until it was eventually found in the British Museum in the 1890s and published in 1898. You probably have all seen my departure point, a description of brief instructions which prefaces one of the online iterations of that text. While George Silver's Paradoxes of Defense was published in 1599, the brief instructions, which is the book which actually explains how to use various weapons instead of merely lecturing about why rapiers are so bad, was apparently not published until a copy of the manuscript was discovered in the British Museum and was subsequently printed in 1898 by Captain Cyril G. R. Matte. The manuscript was not dated, but it mentions Saviolo's book, which was published in 1595. This last from the website www.pbm.com was webbed by Greg Lindahl, who appears has some SCA connection, so perhaps some of you know him. I don't know if he composed the entry or if it was someone else who is uncredited. I have tried emailing him, but so far he has not gotten back to me. The entry also says that the manuscript is in the British Museum in the Sloan Collection, Manuscript 376. Keep that in mind. That will be important later. I think for the dating we can do a bit better than sometime after 1595 uh, for brief instructions, because it refers internally to paradoxes having already been published. We know that was 1599. And more, uh, paradoxes repeated refers to England and Englishmen, while brief instructions references Great Britain and the British, though not Britons. That puts the date of this draft of the manuscript that we have firmly after the death of Elizabeth I and the accession of James I with the union of Scotland to England, Ireland, and Wales. That's got to be in or after 1603 for sure. Now, according to the British Museum's website, the manuscript of Silver's treatise came into the possession of the British Museum in 1753 as part of the Sloan Collection, which was one of the three founding collections of the museum. The museum itself was established in 1570, uh, or 1753 and opened to the public in 1759. Uh, now, this makes rather like Thomas Jefferson's personal library, which was the founding collection of the Library of Congress here in the United States, after the British burned our first Library of Congress in 1815. Now, the Sloan in the Sloan collection is a Dr. Sir Hans Sloan, an eclectic collector and physician, 
uh, bibliophile. The bulk of his library is, according to the museum's description, medical texts, some of which go back to the reign of Henry VIII. It appears that Silver's manuscript was acquired by Sloan from a Dr. Francis Bernard, M.D., physician to James II and to St. Bartholomew's Hospital, also a collector of medical texts. Indeed, Sloan seems to have acquired a large number of medical treatises from Dr. Bernard. So this is why this time uh, keeps marching on and the episode gets longer and uh, continues to be delayed. Every time I think I'm done, I start another rabbit. It turns out that uh, there are, who would have thought, websites that have pocket biographies of famous English physicians and Dr. Bernard and Dr. Sloan are in there. And it appears that Dr. Sloan purchased the collection from Dr. Bernard's estate after his death. And then the British government, it appears, <coughs> acquired Dr. Sloan's collection after his death. This required an act of parliament because this purchase was the foundation of the British Museum. And along with Dr. Sloan's collection, several other collections were acquired at roughly the same time. The Cotton Collection uh, and... Uh, the Royal Library, and were also incorporated into the British Museum so that it was founded by the Act of Parliament in 1753 when Dr. Sloan died, and then the collection was opened in 1759, but only to scholars in the beginning, and then Later, it became the British Museum as we know it today. Dr. Bernard was born in 1628. One doubts that he began collecting books in the birthing room, though with uh, bibliophiles, one never knows, do one. Before Dr. Bernard, we have no named custodian for the silver manuscript so far as I have been able to find. I wonder for how long the silver manuscript was associated with a collection of medical texts that passed perhaps from one collector to another, you know, as part of that stack of things that land on the nightstand and that a reader in book collector intends to look through sometime, or perhaps as part of a collection of books that a bibliophile buys to give a good home to, without ever really intending to read them. In any case, working backwards, we seem to have come to a dead end with Dr. Bernard, at least so far. Now, looking from the other end, I've been looking at possible dates of Silver's death. In 1603, in addition to the accession of James, London suffered 30,000 deaths from the Black Plague out of a population of roughly 200,000. That's 15% of the population. One in six people. Was George Silver one of them? Black Plague was most likely to be fatal in children and in young men. In 1603, Silver would likely have been somewhere between 42 and 47 years of age, so not in either of the highest risk groups, but we know people who are not in the highest risk group sometimes also die. 
Silver dying in 1603 in the midst of composing brief instructions would explain the state of the manuscript we have better than any alternative hypothesis of which I am aware. More on the state of the manuscript as we have it uh, coming up in the live stream. Now, for a long time, it was thought that Silver could not have died so early because J.D. Alward, in his article, George Silver, uh, in Notes and Queries of 1949, said that Silver was reported alive in the visitation of 1622, that is, the visitation of Hampshire. But various doubts have of late been cast upon the reliability of this assertion. I want to thank Keith Farrell, uh, a wonderful teacher and a nice guy who I've had the pleasure and privilege of meeting and studying with in person, and who is a much better researcher than I am, uh, who published an article on J.D. Alward, uh, which is linked in the description below. And through this article, I was able to find Alward's original article and follow Alward's citations back through the records of the visitations of Hampshire upon which Alward based his conclusion. Uh, links in the description below. Now, I would bet Money Marbles are chalk that Alward saw in printed form exactly what I saw online. The descent from Sir Bartholomew Silver knighted by Edward II, running down to what would have been the current generation on the second page of the listing, which includes George. Now, I think uh, we're looking here at the same page that Alward was looking at. Uh, we see four brothers, including George and Toby, of whom we know from the text of Paradoxes, and one sister. And George is the only one shown as married. None are shown as having any living descendants. I think that Alward was looking at this page and seeing that George was married to Mary and looked for the Mary Hayden marriage date because, as you see, there is no indication which visitation of Hampshire produced what information. The information from all the visitations is lumped together which makes them much less useful for research purposes than, say, the United States Census data, in which the information from each particular canvas is linked to the specific year the canvas was done. So I will bet that Alward wound up on the page where I wound up, London Marriage Licenses, 1521 to 1869, uh, by Joseph Foster, 1844-1905, John Ward Dean, 1815-1902. Uh, I found it uh, in a digital archive uh, contributed by the University of California Libraries. Because, of course, they did. Uh, once again, the link. Uh, George Silver and Mary Hayden... Mary in 1580, as advertised. There's an internet rumor, the citation for which I have lost. Uh, you see what I mean about being a dilettante. That Mary Hayden was married again somewhere around 1610, if I recall correctly. There's no possible subsequent marriage for Mary in London marriage licenses that I can find. Uh, there is another marriage for a Mary Hayden, but it is before the marriage of our George and our Mary. And both of the Marys are listed as spinsters rather than widows, so can't be the same Mary. Looking at what we have, I think it is likely that the information about Silver's family was compiled in the 1575 visitation, subsequently amended to include George's marriage, and that the Silvers were no longer in Hampshire in 1622 when the next visitation began. This conclusion is largely because of the five Silvers, uh, George being the eldest, uh, is the only one who is married in the listing we have. 
We know that happened in 1580. Uh, most likely, at least one of his siblings would have married in the 42 years up to 1622. Uh, and somebody would have had at least one offspring who would be the presumptive heir to the silver coat of arms. But there's nothing. Uh, now, in a lot of this, I think I'm shadowing the research, though not reaching all the same conclusions, as Martin Oustwick, uh, in his video, George Silver, A Look at the Man Himself. Uh, link, once again, in the description below. Oustwick mentions a remarriage for Mary, but not the year, or why he believes that the Mary he's talking about was George Silver's Mary. Perhaps this will inspire him to dust off his documentation, expand in a new video. Oustwick also says that the Silvers, or some of them at least, appear to have emigrated to the American colonies, but with no indication of the source, the year, or to which colony. I mean, thank you, Martin Ostwick. Without you breaking the ground, I would likely not have started this rabbit. If you have the scent, give a view halloo so that the, those of us who are interested can pick it up as well. And with that, let us go to the live stream and hear from our panel. His whole second book was lost to us until the 19th century, uh, and one wonders you know, what might have been different had he published uh, the second book, had he actually finished the second book, uh, what revision, from what I've read uh, in Paul's book about the manuscript, it seems like he was in the process of correcting it, the early sections, when I'll he put it get in the, the manuscript. Book. Huh? Uh, I'll go and get the manuscript. Obviously, the, a facsimile, but not. not <laughs> okay. <that correct. laughs> I'm not that rich. Good. There you go. That's brief. There's his brief instructions. All right. That's the. Um, uh, and you've got things like you've got crossed out words. So the people are turning around saying it's a. Uh, it's a it's it's a finished completed work. It's got crossings out. It's got um, there's um, it's got words sort of written in the what's this? Uh, this is a couple of nice little couple of nice little bit bits and pieces here that. Um, uh, that are worth having a look at if I just can't remember which page they're on. You know, say, Stephen, while you look at that, it's just sort of reminded me that recently when we were looking at the the section, the single dagger against the like against the like against the like weapon, we were looking through it and we all actually agree that the way it was written, it seemed to be sort of as if somebody had mentioned it at the end. They went, You haven't done any dagger play, George, and he'd written, Oh crap. And he just put it at the end quick. It's it, it's yeah. quite quick and it's quite simple. It's just like it does it does it does read like it was thrown it in and meant to go back to it. Like oh yeah, it works. I actually, we actually tried it and did a lot of work with it. But it, it does read like he's thrown it in, and to me, obviously, oh, yeah. it would 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 go back to it later. But obviously, never never. Has anybody it. done? Have, have, I did some of the dagger work, um, and you know he says there are no parries at the dagger, and that it's just all. All of the principles of time and distance and place just, um, and I use that, like make a create a threat, draw a response, and then, and then, um, basically draw the draw a counter attack, and then and then go in for the final attack. I find th th this is this is cute. Can you see that little? Oop, all right, that little. Thing there is like a little doodle where he's spilt some ink and he's turned it into a little a little hand with a little <laughs> pointing yeah. finger. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and there's stuff like that. There's stuff like that throughout the throughout the manuscript. Now that um, end, the end sections where in the printed uh, 
copy like the one I have from Paul. It looks like it's sort of an outline or maybe a diagram or a, a tree of decisions or something. Yeah. What does that I, look like? Have, in the have a look, by the way. There's a whole section here that's been crossed out. That's in um, Chapter 5. So that's the grips. Uh, yeah, that's... Um, but let's go to the last section. So... Yeah. Yeah, here we go. This is this is the some of the stuff you're getting. Okay. Yeah, it's um so it's it's real sort of yeah. Okay. That's... Can you bring that closer? Yes. <laughs> okay. It looks a lot like it looks a lot like the notes that I took in class when I was in college. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Um, there was a system of note taking that I was taught where we did that sort of thing uh, with the stepping in uh, of columns across the page. Uh, yes. It, it's very. Yeah, it's that that last the last sections are really sort of stream of consciousness. Um, it does read like that as well. Yeah. Yeah, and and there's it. It I find it very disingenuous when people take individual this individual tiny little snippets um, out of out of context. There's um, one section there, where's my copy? The one section I talked about in my, um, uh, the type, yeah, the, of place, strength, and time. This is in Sundry Kinds of Fight, where he says, the, the time of the foot is when you step forward to strike, when you gather towards your own right side. Um, and then he says, the time of the hand and foot is when you tread your ground and course to strike. Um, yeah, and it's, it sounds almost like it's, it sounds almost like it's, it's, it could be the same thing, but when you, you know, when you analyze and, t and people take, take these, these single statements out of context, but obviously he's not saying, so you could say, step forward to strike and tread your ground and course to strike are the same thing. But then he's saying, well, one's a false time and one's a true time. And that makes no sense at all. So obviously they mean something different. So you then got to sit down and analyze. And so if I step forward to strike, if I step forward to shake your hand, I'm not, you know, if I, if I step forward to shake your hand, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm stepping forward to shake your hand. I'm, stepping forward to do something so one precedes the other and um yeah there's there's some and there's whole there's a whole section here which i've, I've one of my senior students and i've been discussing that um does it is it is it general or does it just refer to one fight and i've already talked about the the thing where it says to move your foot circularly away from the direction you're attacked. And if that's a universal principle, it sort of makes no sense because it, it, it contradicts what he says about in garden fight. When in fact, when he says that all your gatherings in that fight be to your enemy's right. In that yeah. section, he's talking yeah. about gardens. In the section where he says move your foot circularly away, he's talking about he's talking about variable fight, but he never explicitly says in variable fight move your foot circularly away from the direction of the attack. In garden fight, he just says garden, 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 and then says in that fight let all your gatherings be to your enemies' right. And we're back. No. This is the other rabbit I have started. Someone 
in an article or video recently said that they prefer the late sources uh, from the 18th and 19th century to the earlier sources for swordsmanship because they are manuals rather than treatises. The distinction being that a manual is a technical document using the conventions of technical writing, which involves being explicit, exhaustive, and among other things, using exactly the same word or expression every single time to mean exactly the same thing. Because the author is writing for a student whom they have not met or taught and who they will likely never meet or teach. In the earlier treatises, they are largely written from a more literary or memnonic point of view to provide the student who has studied with the master an interesting and entertaining way of remembering their lessons and practicing them without the master present. My feeling is that George Silver has taught somebody combat arts. His teaching method is too developed and on point for him to have not. But Silver is not a fencing teacher professionally. He could not be a fencing teacher and maintain his status as a gentleman. So, if he taught, as I think he did, it would have been private lessons for a nephew or the son of a friend or for some younger friend, and definitely not for pay. But Silver is moving in the direction of creating a manual for students that he would not ever personally teach. He is working towards regularizing his vocabulary, and we can see this in his end section where he hasn't quite brought all of his vocabulary within the conventions of the more complete parts of the manuscript which preceded. For example, in the end section, he refers once and only once, to naked fight. From the context, I feel it is clear that he means uh, exactly what he calls elsewhere open fight. He may, in his conversation and in his personal instruction, have used the two terms, naked fight and open fight, interchangeably. But with this one exception, he has regularized his usage throughout all of the more finished parts of the manuscript. Another example of incomplete regularization of the text is the use of both patient and patient agent, which appear to me to be interchangeable terms, but which he has at the point at which he leaves the manuscript yet to bring into uniformity. So, uh, as to Silver's actual profession... Uh, I find Martin Ostwick's suggestion that Silver might have been at law at the Inns of Court interesting. It would, it would give us a reason for him to have had experience at trying to refine a precision of language. But if he was there, there ought to be some documentation somewhere though maybe not in London, because they had that little fire, you know. The inter -temp or, excuse me, Inner Temple Library notes, the fire destroyed most of the Inner Temple, but this marked the western extent of its damage. The Middle Temple escaped almost unscathed, with only one building lost. Uh, citation once again, description below. The other thread I haven't been able to tease out, which has me wondering, is the presence of Silver's manuscript in a collection of medical treatises. If not George Silver himself, was there somebody else in the family who was a physician or an apothecary or had some other connection to the medical world? Was that or something like that responsible for the Brief Instructions manuscript becoming part of a medical collection? Perhaps the medical person in the family was Silver's literary executor. With that, we reach the end of my researches and speculations. For now, 
Thank you again to the members of the live stream panel, who in this episode were Stephen Hand, Duncan McAvoy, Alan Burns, and Gareth Jones. Uh, thank you once again to Keith Parrell for his researches on J.D. Aylward and to Martin Auswick for pointing me towards a number of sources and sparking my ideas. And to whomever I have stolen uh, the idea, which I have not been able to attribute, thank you too. Let me know so I can credit you in the show notes. Finally, as always, thanks to Michael for his efforts in editing out this video. If you have enjoyed this excursion into chasing George Silver's manuscript, please like, comment, subscribe, click the bell uh, for more of the true fight of George Silver. Until soon, see you on the flip side. As most of you know, I have been studying the true fight of George Silver for about three and a half years now. I am not an expert. I'm just a student trying to share the resources that I have found helpful and the conclusions that I have reached so far. I rely heavily upon the expertise of those who have gone before, and I intend to credit their works and opinions whenever I reference them. If I have failed to do so, or you feel that I have misrepresented or misattributed your views or failed to state that a certain erroneous view is entirely my own, please let me know in the comments or privately, and I will endeavor to make corrections and amends in a subsequent video. All errors are, of course, entirely my own. Like, comment, subscribe. We'll see you on the flip side.